welcome Dr. Andrea Sanders, Associate Professor from Chattanooga State Technical Community College. Andrea teaches English 2120, American Literature 2, as part of the Regents Online Degree Program. She's also a member of the RODP Curriculum Committee. And today we're here to talk to Andrea about non-judgmental rigor in online classes. So Andrea, what exactly is non-judgmental rigor? Well, that's just a, a term that um, my colleague and I coined. That means a combination of rigorous um, classroom environment and uh, upholding standards that you would uphold normally in your class, uh, but at the same time making the classroom experience non-threatening, um, making the classroom environment one of uh, collegiality and uh, creating a learning community that is um, safe and yet demanding. And uh, in a nutshell, that's what, that's what it means. Uh, okay. Let me follow up a couple of questions on that, Andrea. One, is it achievable? And two, do you recognize when you've achieved it? <laughs> I do think it's achievable. And um, I don't know whether it's, it's luck or <laughs> something that I've really accomplished as a teacher. I like sure. to think the latter, of course. But uh, I do feel that I've achieved it in my classes, which, which I suppose is what led me to think about it. I noticed that whereas in um, on-ground classes, um, I didn't always have control over the environment. Uh, and sometimes due to a particular mood a student might be in or events outside our control, weather, what have you, um, you don't always create the environment that you want to have in your classroom. You have students who are less motivated than others, um, along with students who are very serious about their work and might get distracted. Um, and it's very difficult for a teacher on the spot to deal with issues like that, as I know you both know. Whereas in the online classroom, I've discovered it's, uh, it's been rather smooth sailing in that regard because um, there are certain techniques that I can use as an instructor that prepare the ground for the student's response to me to be, um, the word I like to use is professional. What I'm able to do is create a professional environment in which the focus is on the content and on mutual respect and on an old-fashioned word, politeness, mm -hmm. <laughs> and courteous, courteous behavior. And uh, I do think that as a teacher, what I can do is prepare that ground, both in the way I design the course and in the way I communicate with students, uh, particularly in a quick response time and an appropriate and courteous response that I, that I am at leisure to frame, mm -hmm. because I'm usually emailing. And when those, uh, when those things occur at the beginning of class, it sets the stage for the students to follow up in the same way. And so what I have found is students um, very accommodating, very courteous, very, um, and performing at a very high standard in my online classes, uh, at least to a larger degree than I had experienced before. So are you looking for that kind of relationship to occur not only between the online student and you the instructor but between student to student within the course. Absolutely and that's that's very well put so that it is a learning community. One part of this is um, in online teaching more so perhaps in the on-ground classroom the instructor is actually more of a mediator mm -hmm. than a what's the term sage on the stage mm -hmm. uh, so it's less um, audience uh, performer relationship then it is um, someone sort of sitting at the, at the hub of the class, you know, the, the wizard behind the curtain pulling the, the ropes and the switches to make things happen, but not necessarily coming out from the curtain to take center stage. And, and part of this non-judgmental rigor is to create an environment where um, the students themselves take ownership of the class and uh, respond to each other, as you said, and they, res and they respond respectfully, and they become learning resources for each other. Mm -hmm. And so the instructor is a learning resource, a mediator, and at times um, the instructor's duty is to intervene if, uh, and intervene early if, if something does seem to be going on that shouldn't be, uh, perhaps students 
personalities have come into conflict or a certain topic for an assignment may trigger an emotional response that mm -hmm. neither you nor the other students expected because they, you know, none of us know where each of the others have been and what they've experienced. The instructor can intervene in the online class in a way that's impossible in an on-ground situation. Um, I guess one of the best examples is in the discussion board area, uh, which is one of the primary ways you create the learning community mm -hmm. environment. Um, you want to, well several things are okay. at play here. You want to um, get discussion started and you want an, to offer a meaningful and open-ended question to allow the students then to, to come in and, and express themselves um, fully. Um, but at the same time you want to be, you want to be making sure that uh, if, if someone does begin to express themselves in a way that would be inappropriate, you can quickly fire off an email uh, in most course management systems when you're on the discussion board, you can send a private email mm -hmm. just at the click sure. of a button. So then you can say, and here's where the non-judgmental rigor comes in. Um, the non-judgmental part is, is how I respond to that student. The student is, is behaving inappropriately, mm -hmm. uh, electronically, but it's still behaving. Right. <laughs> I don't want to judge that student. Um, as we just mentioned, I never know what's going on with that student. That student may have just had a uh, wife die or a child be um, paralyzed or you just really never know where the student is coming from mm -hmm. when they're doing something that, that seems you know, overtly hostile or um, critical either to another student or the professor. So I, give, I think it's important if you're going to have exercise non-judgmental rigor to uh, be very um, uh, objective, stick to the facts, and give that student the benefit of the doubt. I mean, you can, you can simply use your imagination. And instead of saying, uh, if it's an angry comment directed toward the professor, I could say, why does that student hate me? Mm -hmm. Why does the student hate the class? What did I ever do? I mean, I could go down that route right. and spiral down and respond likewise. And that, of course, creates the snowball effect. Then you have conflict and strife. No learning takes place. What I can do instead is use my imagination and say, um, clearly this student is having problems. Leave it at that. Respond to the student by saying, um, I see that this assignment um, has, um, ups I may not even want to use the word upset, but I see that this assignment troubles you in some way. Can you help me understand mm -hmm. what it is you're, what it is you're, is going on here? And is there any way that I can help you? And those, those two things are um, uh, incredibly helpful to you as an instructor to remember, help me make sure I understand you. So you're saying, you're not saying, I need to help you because you, you need help. Mm -hmm. You know, you're saying to the student, help me understand what's going on with you. And then the other thing is, is to say, can I help you? Mm -hmm. So um, offering help and not offering criticism, but just saying, let me help you. And that's where learning takes place, is if you can then understand where the student is coming from, what's going on, and not to evaluate the student's psychiatric state or, you know, it's, it, in some senses it's, it's funny because that sounds like a, a personal involvement with the student and, and it is, and yet it's not. It's right. still maintaining a professional distance from the situation. And of course you, you know I'm, t I'm speaking in that analyst language mm -hmm. here <laughs> when, I, when I redirect the question back to the student. Uh, and I'm doing that on purpose so that um, because what's going on is the student doesn't understand him or herself. Right. And that's the source of the problem. I'm reminded of the scenario of the parent working with the child and the child expressed frustration over not being able to achieve some kind of manipulative skill or something. Mm -hmm. And the parent then looks at him and said, son, be patient. <laughs> you know, in a very... Right, right, sense. right, right. But we have those same kinds of nonverbal mm -hmm. qualities mm -hmm. in our electronic communication with we students, do. don't we? That's an excellent point, Skip. Um, uh, whereas in the classroom, 
you have, well, and, and here I am throwing my, my hands around, I'm expressing myself physically as, as well as verbally. You hear the tone of my voice, mm -hmm. you see the expression on my face, and I can say, Skip, you failed that exam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know I'm elbowing you in the side, and I'm right. saying, you know, we, we go way back, Skip, and, I, and we know you failed this exam, but you're gonna try it again and you're gonna do better. And so it's okay. Mm -hmm. We both feel fine about it. We know it's just a, a marker of your progress and you're gonna go back and try again. But imagine, Skip, getting an email from me that just says, you failed this test. And you know, there's no opening, there's no closing, there's no what we call politeness formula. Mm -hmm. Another way to do that would be to say, dear Skip, you know, it doesn't, that's impersonal because even though I'm saying dear, that's the traditional opening formula. And as with a personal letter, I might use a comma instead of a colon, dear Skip, comma. Um, in reviewing your scores over the last couple of tests, I noticed that you made a 62 on one and a 58 on the other. He's not doing very well. Uh, <laughs> is there something I can do to help you study for the next exam so that you will improve your grade? Sure. Sincerely, and I usually sign myself Dr. S mm -hmm. instead of Dr. Sanders. It's somewhere between the formality of Dr. Sanders, but it's not quite to Andrea. And it makes you approachable. It makes right. me a little more approachable. But but again, that's totally up to the instructor. And the other thing I really believe firmly in is is the instructor's own style. Mm -hmm. you, you one part of this non-judgmental rigor, one part of this pers professor persona concept that David White uh, has talked about is that you are not exactly yourself as you are mm -hmm. in real life. You're probably a better you, but it's still you. It's not someone else. Uh, if I went out and tried to be David White, I would be a failure as a teacher because we are different in so many fundamental ways, um, just in our personalities and so on and so forth. Um, that that would be a mistake, mm -hmm. you know, to try to put on a mask and I would try to be Mary in class. Right. I just couldn't do that. So you need to be yourself and let yes. that come through, mm -hmm. even if you're teaching someone else's content, mm -hmm. if someone else developed the course. Absolutely. And of course that comes through in the email and it comes right. through in the discussion. And, and I'll, I'm going to reinforce that because I think it's so important that we, because we are the originators usually of the email, we don't realize how we come across an email mm -hmm. because it's a very stark medium. It's just letters on a page. Right. And you have, to, you have to learn sort of the internal code of email, the between the lines kind mm -hmm. of code because, uh, and again, I'm not saying to baby the students or hold their hands, but just to make sure they get the message you're sending, you still have to do a little extra coding in terms of the politeness formulas, uh, some people use happy faces, which mm -hmm. other people frown on, but if I'm saying something like, you failed the test, can I help you do better next time? If I put a smiley face on there, the student knows that I'm not, I'm not criticizing the student as a person. Right. But rather, and there are other ways, again. Depending I'm, on where you put that smiley face. <laughs> you failed this test, smiley face, they may interpret it as, <laughs> what do you think ha -ha. you're doing? Right. Going back to the exactly. politeness and email too, do you think as more and more students are text messaging and instant messaging and developing their mm -hmm. own shorthand that politeness is losing its place or that students don't exactly know what a polite email looks like? You know, that, that's a great question and that's a whole other <laughs> segment we should do someday because um, there's a lot of issues involved. For one thing, we are all of a completely different generation and we don't know the rules. I mean, mm -hmm. just to put it bluntly, we don't know their rules. So I know they have politeness formulas within their set of rules, but those are all done with the two thumbs, right? right? And <laughs> you is not wow you, you is you. you. And <laughs> I'm sure that it's considered extremely polite to write those little terse, tiny messages. Mm -hmm. And so that would translate to, to us older generation folks as a blunt, rude right. response. Or oftentimes, an Ill, we think of it as an illiterate response, whereas the person may be perfectly capable of writing standard written English, but they don't understand that that's what they should be using in that email environment right. because they're so used to emailing their friends. But you can cover that by um, making it very clear at the beginning of class. And particularly, I think, in an English class, you should. Mm -hmm. 
and probably any other class as well. But again, you can set it up with professionalism because you know your, stu your students would need to know that in a professional emailing environment, uh, people do tend to stick to more of the you know the standards of written English. Uh, and again, it all goes back to communication. Okay. And uh, you know the the two things I would stress the most about non-judgmental rigor would be course design and then would be communication. Those are the two big uh, important factors. And when you design your course, it should be, um, I have this, this term that I like, transparent design. Your course should be transparent in design, meaning that communication should be effortless on the front end. Uh, and, and what I'm talking about here is not the communication you do in emails and discussion, but the communication that your course itself does, it speaks for itself in a way, because you've already put all the material in an online course on the front end, how far can your students get without needing to email you? That's the test of a transparent course you're, you're design. You're talking about the navigability of it, yes, the intuitiveness exactly. of the course. Exactly. It struck me a moment ago while you were talking about some of the non-judgmental rigor, especially in email communication. We have recognized, I think, fairly obviously in online education of the ability for students to have time to reflect upon the work they're doing, uh, to have time to review, and uh, you're, you have the opportunities for, for evaluation and resubmittal and all of this. But one of the great advantages that is so often uh, not quite as possible in the face-to-face -face communication, face-to-face -face classroom, is you have the opportunity to reflect for a while before you give that student the response to that failing exam. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you walk in the That's classroom right. and you hand everybody yeah. their, their test papers back and mm -hmm. then you see the expression on their face and you're trying to be stoic about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the online environment, you go, you're going to have the opportunity to yeah. reflect about how you're mm -hmm. going to Talk about that communication. Story. Oh, well, I, I think that's a, an excellent point, Skip. The, the ability to reflect on both ends is invaluable. And, and the ability to correct. Um, re reflection um, can help immensely if you do get a, uh, an email from a student that you, you know, your initial reaction is you should have known that already. You should have done that already. You should have whatever already you're mm -hmm. judging you're saying why are you bothering me with this <laughs> now it's all laid out for example in course module number one everything you have to do um, and then you email me and say what am I supposed to do for assignment number one so your immediate, immediate response is um, gut level right, right. <laughs> so um, online is great because I can fire off a really mean email <laughs> to that student. <laughs> but then I can stop and say, I can think through my consequences. What will happen? You all know what will happen. Right. If I fire that off, I get one right back, and then it snowballs, and we have a big mess. Mm -hmm. If I just stop and think it through and remain objective and professional, um, I write back and ideally, the first thing I do is specifically answer the student's actual question. A lot of times when we email <coughs> reflexively, we're not really answering the question. Sometimes we never do get to the answer to the mm -hmm. question. We're so busy uh, saying, why are you acting this way? You right. know. So if you can just stick to the pragmatic approach of you will find the assignment for assignment number, or the content for assignment number one in your module number one on page 13. Um, I wouldn't actually, as a side note, I wouldn't actually tell them what the assignment is. Mm -hmm. I would direct them to where it is in the course right. because that helps them learn it and it helps them not ask you uh, about the next one when that comes around. But sometimes I've had to revise emails to students three or four times before I hit that, mm -hmm. that nice tone of professionalism. Uh, again, s um, staying with my standards, if if the student is asking you where an assignment is the day before a five-page paper is due, you know, that student may not pass that assignment. I won't, I won't fudge on that if, due to their negligence, they have um, missed the assignment. But on the other hand, I will give them all the help I can before the assignment right. is due and not, not worry too much about the who's right, who's wrongs of it. Mm -hmm. 
And um, that's worked very well, as we said at the beginning, of to uh, create that uh, positive learning environment for, for me and for my students. Sounds very good. Andrew, we've talked about both the uh, email and discussion board, and those are two key communication tools. And I think they're very uh, likely to be heavily used in the practice of non-judgmental rigor. Mm -hmm. But there can be non-judgmental rigor, and especially non-judgmental approach to, do, to presentation of material within the course content itself, within content modules, and, and within uh, the actual workings of the course, can't there? Um, sure, there, there can be. Um, and I'm, boy, now I'm trying to think of an example. Um, well, let me, let me cite this one. Okay. I, I have had instructors and have worked with colleagues who can use irony and can use uh, uh, situational uh, descriptions in class and can, and, and can be very vivid in those descriptions. Mm -hmm. But it takes their physical presence there yes, and, it, and uh -huh. it takes their uh, nonverbal skills to really communicate the irony of what they're trying to present and that may not come across mm -hmm. as well in the online That's a course, good point. in the text version especially. And um, that just brings a whole lot of things to mind, Skip, one of which is it is very instructive for the online instructor to go and be an online student yeah. yes. before they teach because it really brings home what you've just said. Uh, there will be times when you just have a big question mark over your head. Mm -hmm. You really don't understand what the instructor was getting at and it, it might be something like that where irony was intended or uh, something that's not communicated through words alone but something the instructor is used to, to, to performing in class mm -hmm. or having some kind of, uh, of uh, non-textual communication. That's a really good point. So I, I guess just um, in a general way, the, the practice of non-judgmental rigor in the, in the content of the class would be, the, again, that transparency. And, and another thing I was just jotting down as you were talking, because I think it's so important to this whole scenario, it may be on top of the list, I'm not sure. Transparency of course design and um, communication and then sense of humor is what mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Oh, without a doubt. If you can have a sense of humor, or at least keep a light touch. And mm -hmm. of course that will go into um, course design. Chemistry is not a barrel of laughs, I don't imagine. I don't teach it, but I know that you can do things to, to, to lighten the mood. I've right. seen a wonderful online chemistry course. It's got images, you know, it's got real live experiments that you do in your own home. I mean, uh, Oh, I know what the other key word is, interactivity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interactivity. And you can certainly build that into your course. And that creates a dynamic, active learning environment instead of, again, one where the, the instructor is just talking and the students are soaking right. it up. So you, the non-judgmental rigor, too, you want the students to be able to learn and explore, feel safe. Yes. Feel safe asking questions of you. Absolutely. Feel safe right. posting things to the discussion board. Mm -hmm. um, and if there is a problem, you really want to focus on the behavior of the specific problem and not the person. Exactly. Especially in those That's classes exactly where maybe you've right. had a troublesome student in a traditional classroom mm -hmm. and now they're in your online class and you've got some preconceived notions about them. Mm -hmm. um, managing them well. Mm -hmm. What are some other differences that you see between electronic communication and face-to-face? -face? Things that don't come across well, things that work well. Um, you know, any challenges that you see to maintain this non-judgmental rigor when the student can't see what you're saying and can't read your body language? Well, I think we've, we've covered a lot about that when we, you know, we talked about the emailing and the importance of being uh, very clear in what you are going to say. Um, I think, uh, again, the, the, the real danger spots, uh, and I don't always get this right myself, I wouldn't pretend to have gotten there, but um, are when you are in a hurry and you want to dash something off or you want your student has a real genuine question and you don't have time to answer it so there are some skills that an, an online instructor can can put to work there that are really helpful and, and one is if you if you don't have the time that you need to really genuinely respond because a student will, will if you if you send a terse or inadequate reply the student will read that is 
that instructor doesn't care about me. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's not the way you intended it, but, and it, but it makes sense to read it that way. Right. So what you can do is quickly say, I will get back to you later. I'm sorry I have to dash off right now. Any student will, will understand that. They also have busy lives. And then you use that little feature, Mark is unread, mm -hmm. and, and Mark is unread the original email so that you won't forget to come back to it, so that the next time when you do have time, you can address it. And do you think that's better than just leaving that email? Oh, yes. Okay. If you open that email and you don't answer it, by the time you come back to your class, you will have forgotten it. Um, at least I would. <laughs> and then the student feels that you don't care ignored. about them or you've Absolutely ignored them ignored. in their problem and you're not, they're not And important. I know we've mentioned this already, but the response time is, is critical. Um, and I know David has mentioned his study of, uh, of students at his campus and their primary concern is communication and response time. If you don't, if a student, and I've, I've actually had students tell me this, in some online classes they'll say, I had an assignment due on Saturday. On Monday, I asked my professor a question about that assignment, but I didn't get a, a reply until Saturday afternoon. And so consequently, I wasn't able to work on the assignment mm -hmm. with the instructor's help. Basically, the instructor was not present in the classroom. So I think it's critical for us as instructors to hold ourselves to the same standards we would hold our students to, and that is to be present, very mm -hmm. present in the classroom. That by makes, checking in frequently. Makes a lot of sense. Discuss the value of colleague review of your content in terms of non-judgmental rigor. Oh, well, that's a great idea. I've never <laughs> thought about that either. I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I think about getting reviewed, what I want is for someone to do what we talked about, and, and that is to go in as a student see how far they can get. Mm -hmm. If they sit down at the computer and open up my course and they're just stymied, they really don't know what to click on next, uh, and they have to just sort of start randomly clicking, mm -hmm. that's not a very good class. And I would, I would appreciate if a peer would, would do that for me and would sit down and review the course. And, and that's where you get the feel for it. I think mm -hmm. without, before you even exchange an email with the instructor, you can get a feel for uh, the kind of instructor you have there, and we all have different styles, and it's not better or worse, it's just different. Some of us will be rigidly organized, you know, and everything will be all in a, well, mm -hmm. you know, you think of linear thinkers, some of us are like that, some of us are kind of randoms, and uh, you'll, you'll know you start here, and then from here I can go here, here, or here, then when I get here, you know, right. <laughs> some of us will, will take that kind of abstract approach to the course. Both work, but both reveal a completely different kind of professor. And as you both know, the linear thinking student will have a lot more trouble mm -hmm. understanding. So I guess what that really says, and I should clarify this, we should always strive to meet the needs of either kind of student. So we shouldn't go way out on a limb either way. But, um, and I'm not sure I completely <laughs> answered your question, mm -hmm. but I think non-judgmental rigor is to create a a class environment where I'm, first of all, from the outset, very clearly aware of what's expected of me sure. and what I should have learned when I get out of the class. Mm -hmm. That's of primary importance. And then the other part is to create that environment, I, I liked your word, safe environment there, where I can explore and learn about the topic without worrying about what the instructor um, might be, well, I, I mean, I know this sounds a little bit uh, um, touchy-feely, but I think as students, they do worry what we think about them. I mean, yes, I, they think, sure. I, think that, I think that becomes an anxiety for them mm -hmm. that doesn't have to be there. So if, they, if you take the stress and the anxiety out of the learning environment, they're free to explore and play around a little bit and have, have, some, have a good time, have a good learning experience. Well, especially online. for the new online student who's also having to master the technology, the safer you can make it, and the, that's right. the structure that's there so they know what to do will make them feel a little less and, you hesitant. You know, and my colleagues at Chattanooga State and I talk about how wonderful that is when they t start taking care of each other and they mm -hmm. almost put you out of a job because right. you've got the experienced online students who are helping the inexperienced online students and you're just kind of watching. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part, that's you right. know, where it, where it really takes off and they know each other and, and of course they have a whole other world 
uh, behind the scenes because they mm -hmm. can email each other as well and they build their community that way as well. Is it sometimes non-judgmental in the online course to allow yourself as the instructor to stand back, not respond immediately, and I don't mean to, to be irre irresponsive to the, to the student, but to stand back just long enough to allow helpmates from the class to, to come to the aid of that student? Oh, yes, I think so. Uh, Each I, of them learn that I'll way. bet you're saying that from experience, too, Skip, because uh, it, it is so very true that if you can, and again, it goes back to not wanting to be in the middle of everything mm -hmm. as the instructor. It's a student-centered approach, uh, uh, ideally. And so you you do hold back a little bit. You lurk, you know, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, and wait to see. Like, as you say, not in an irresponsible way. If someone's floundering, you need to come to their aid, but if you can wait a little while and let them help each other, I think it, it does go a long way toward creating that environment. And they, and they will, and they do, and it's wonderful to see. And I think that's the way they take ownership of the class and the content of the class in a way that they might not otherwise. You've mentioned in your workshops, Andrea, that professionalism means celebrating success, sharing disappointments. Expand on that. Yes, um, that goes into the idea of creating a positive learning environment. And I think uh, anyone who's worked um, in any kind of uh, corporation or a volunteer community project or anything where you're working with a group of people, it's extremely important to celebrate events in the lives of the people that you work with. And the opposite is true as well. If, if uh, devastating things happen, you can't go around and pretend it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It's important to acknowledge it and offer support. And so I think that's true in the online environment as well. And uh, so some of, the, some of the things that we've done in my classes, and I know other online instructors do this as well, uh, if uh, someone has a baby, for example, it's really fun <laughs> to set up just a little baby site. And one time I had three people no, it was two people had babies, but one was a set of twins. Oh, wow. So we had three babies born in the course of our semester, and so we put up the baby pictures, and of course everybody appropriately oohed and awed mm -hmm. over the babies and, and said congratulations, and they're beautiful, and of course we let, uh, I've forgotten his name, but we let this um, student have a little extra time on his papers, no mm -hmm. harm done, and he was, he was a very happy father, and, and, and then it was one of the women in my class who had the twins that semester. We've um, also had uh, students in our classes who've been deployed and have had to go and, you know, fight for our country. And when that happens, um, uh, we've actually had uh, uh, the spouses of these students who had to take an incomplete and go off come in and uh, give us their address at their military base and students have mailed, sent mail to them. At the, at the base to show their support. Um, and another example that comes to mind is just this semester, we had a student come into my class who was um, a survivor of uh, Re uh, Rita, is that the right name? The hurricane. Which one? Katrina? Was Katrina. Okay. Where did I get Rita? I'm that was sorry. The other hurricane. Was it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this was, she was a Katrina survivor and uh, had to leave her home and leave school. And so uh, she did get enrolled in, in, our, in our class. And then again, um, we acknowledged her presence. Everyone said, hi, how are you? Great to have you. And she had many offers of help uh, in catching up. And we were all, well, she was from Louisiana and she took as her special project, Kate Chopin, whose book, The Awakening, takes place in Louisiana on the Gulf and in that culture. And, um, of course, so it was, it, it, that sort of uh, thing uh, obviously does not add to the content per se of mm -hmm. your class, but it does enrich the community that you're building in your class, and there are many, many, many side benefits to doing that. You know, I've heard all these examples you've talked about throughout our discussion today, and the word that keeps coming to my sense is empathy. Mm -hmm. to empathize with our students, to recognize that they are humans, mm -hmm. they have some of the same issues day in and day out that we have, and uh, 
the ability to professionally recognize that mean I think means a lot to them. I think that's putting the nail, putting the hammer on the nail, yeah. hitting the nail on the head is what I meant to say. And I could put that a little differently and that is to, to just, to simply enjoy your students, yeah. mm -hmm. to enjoy your students and what they do. It doesn't mean you don't hold them to as high a standard. You do, but while you're holding them to that standard, standard, you're enjoying them at the same time. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. Andrea Sanders, who is a, an associate professor of English at Chattanooga State Community College, has joined us today. This is Mary Nunley to my immediate right and as assistant professor at Volunteer State Community College. I'm Skip Sparkman at Vol State also. This has been a collaborative effort of Volunteer State Community College, of Chattanooga State Community College, of Walter State Community College, and of the Regents Online Degree Program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.